The opening few verses of John's Gospel, at first you may wonder, why are we looking at this for Advent? Well, it's because of John's, um, John's purpose, as we mentioned last week, and I'll mention again this week. Each of the Gospel writers are writing the same story, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what we would call the synoptic, or um, synoptic is really just a word for saying they all saw the same thing, what we saw. They're talking about the story of Jesus. John, John writes his gospel much, much later in time. Well after the first three synoptic gospels, we have John, which explains why it is so different in tone and in content. But that is also explained by the fact that John has a very specific point that he wants to get across. And in fact, if you've got your Bible there, flip to the end of John. John... Or, or make a note, John 20. If you want to know, John actually puts the purpose of, of his gospel at the end, in his conclusion. At John 20, at the very end of that chapter, you have two verses. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now, here at verse 31, here's why John, here's what he wants, here's the whole purpose of his writing. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John's gospel point, the point of his writing and his dearest desire, is that not so much the story of Jesus would be told, but that the person of Jesus would become known. And that is why we come to this at Advent. Advent, of course, the time where we prepare for Christmas. We prepare to celebrate and commemorate the coming of the incarnation of Christ, the coming of he who would be the lamb to take away the sins of the world, and he who's coming we as Christians dearly, and I don't know about you, for my, for my soul, desperately look forward to his coming again. And so last week we began to look at John John writes these words. Here's the first five verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen. Lord, that is blessing to that reading. So last week, and if you, uh, if you weren't here last week, you can, find, uh, you can find that archived either on the church's YouTube channel or uh, my, personal, um, my personal YouTube channel. Last week, I managed to get through, oh, about the first three verses here. And uh, we just a brief recap. We are really looking here. John begins his gospel with a bang. Who is Jesus? He is God. He is God. He is the Word. The Greek uh, manuscripts use the word logos, and last week we looked at how both uh, Greek minds and ears and Jewish minds and ears would have heard and understand that word. And taken combined, we can start to understand why John uses this word logos. We might as well and could very accurately read here, in the beginning was the reason for everything. In the beginning was the reason that there is, in fact, anything. And in the beginning is the reason that anything continues to exist. That is the idea of the logos. It is that which gives purpose to the universe, to all of creation, that which... Um, in here, we see not only created it, but elsewhere throughout the Bible, we see sustains it. In him, in Christ, was not anything made that was made. And of course, only God can speak something into creation. And therefore, John already begins, if you want to know who Christ is, he is the Word, he is God, he is fully God. As well, though, he is the second person in the Trinity, so we began to look at that last week, and of course that, those first three verses took up most of my time 
But I wasn't satisfied with that. I thought, no, we're going to continue to take a look at this. Because these next two verses also speak deeply into Advent and deeply into the rest of the story of who Christ is. His Advent, of course, being the opening act in that larger story. And you'll note here that we begin to see two words. If you're you're one of those who are unopposed to marking up your Bible, you might want to kind of pencil or underline these. These two words, this of course being the introduction to John's gospel, he's now introducing not only Christ, but he's going to start introducing various words and themes that are going to play and carry a very important part again and again throughout the rest of these 21 chapters. And these two words are life and light. Life and light. In fact, life just by way of trivia here, is used 36 times in John's gospel. It's very important to him, as you read just in the conclusion, as he concludes, he wraps everything up, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and in believing you may have life in his name. Well, there's a very interesting supposition in that. And sometimes it's very useful to look at what the Bible says because it will always, in its... In its clear statement of truth, there is almost always a falsehood or another truth that is either being clarified or a falsehood that is being corrected. Again, if you've still got that closing passage of John there, that you may have life in his name. The insinuation, right? Let me walk you through this. The insinuation is that outside of his name, you have no life. Does that make sense? That outside of Christ, all there is, is death. And so if you want to know who Christ is, and why it is so imperative that you come to him, follow him, repent of sins, it is because in him and in him alone is life. So, let's take a look at these, I'll try to get through these first five verses of John this week. Starting at verse 4. Yes, these the, um, introduce, sorry, I have it highlighted here. I didn't want to leave this out. These are contrastive themes as well, contrastive themes, because, yes, John is going to talk about life, but he's also going to talk about death. He's going to talk about light, but he's also going to talk about darkness. In fact, I have it here, again, file this under biblical trivia, perhaps. Darkness is used 17 times in the New Testament. 14 of those times are used by John. He uses darkness eight times in this gospel, six times in 1 John, which is a a letter, an epistle he wrote to churches not long after writing this. That makes darkness an almost exclusive Johnian word. And he's contrasting darkness with light. And he's saying light is life, and it comes, both of those things, only through Christ. So let's start by looking at life. Life in the Greek manuscripts here is the word zoe. Um, You'll see it transliterated Z-O-E. It is zeta, eta, epsilon. That's my Greek make my Greek teachers proud, it is zoe. Uh, There is another word, perhaps, that you may be familiar with that could be translated life, and that would be bios, or biot, from which we, if we have scientists, I know we have some medical professionals here, that is from which we would draw an English word like biology, the study of life, or um, something, you know, all of those, uh, all of those bio words, biodiversity, biosphere, we're studying life. Uh, Bios is accurately translated life, as in something is alive. We look around, we see the world full of life. But that is not the word that is used here. Here it is zoe. Now, zoe can mean life in a very broad definition. Um, Yeah, let me me walk you through the, the broad kind of one way. So, we're used this way. Uh, Zoe would mean general creation, let's say. That would be life as in, uh, in the beginning was in him is life. So saying that without Christ, without the triune 
perfection that is God, there is nothing living. And we see this in, in the Genesis account. God speaks. After having separated the land from the waters and the day from nights, he then fills the creation with living things, with the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the plants in the land and everything that, you know, the KJV, that creepeth or flieth or swim in the waters. And eventually we have a sixth day creation where he creates Adam, he creates man, and breathes into his nostrils the very breath of life, and Adam becomes a living Soul. So we could use this word to talk about life kind of in general, and here it could be accurately seen that in these opening five verses, John is saying, in the beginning was Christ, and Christ was with God, and Christ was God, and Christ was the voice in Genesis 1-1 that says, let there be, insert creation here, and summarize that by saying, in him was life. And that wouldn't be disingenuous. That would be quite accurate. But again, if we look at the purpose of John's gospel, which is why I had you look at the end first, zoe can not only mean kind of life in general, but really more specifically, and this is what differentiates it from bios, zoe is spiritual life. The primary focus of John's gospel is that you may know that Jesus is the Christ and that knowing and believing and professing Jesus to be the Christ, that is the Messiah, that is the Savior of the world, that is the one and only mediator of the new covenant, the one to come and pay for all of sins, to be the propitiation for our sins with his shed blood on the cross, all encompassed in that knowing him that you may have then spiritual life in his name. Now again, if there is only spiritual life available through Christ and Christ alone, what is the opposite insinuation? That outside of Christ there is only spiritual death. There is only spiritual darkness. And this again is affirmed time and time again by scripture, that men are dead in their sins and their trespasses. That is the default position of life. In other words, what we could have here in this word is both and at the same time temporal life and spiritual life. Same with light and dark. When we look at light, light is a very biblical word. John does not have the, um, does not have the monopoly on light, although he does have the majority on it. When we talk about light, when John talks about light, what he's really talking about is biblical truth. What he's really talking about is holiness or purity, the attributes of God. What he's talking about here specifically is Christ. Contrast this with darkness. When we talk about darkness, we're talking about not truth. We're talking about error. We're talking about falsehood. We're not talking anymore about holiness and purity. We're talking about sin and wickedness and godlessness. And we're no longer looking at Christ he who is the king of the kingdom of light. No, darkness is the domain of Satan. Dark is the kingdom of Satan. Dark is the world in its current fallen sinful state. So there's some terminology out of the way. Turn to verse 4. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So, I start with this. This stems from the assertion that Christ is creator. We, have, we can't look at verse 4 without looking at 1, 2, and 3. So, John has already established in the beginning was Christ, and Christ creates, and Christ sustains, and yes, as we looked at that Genesis account, then out of creation, Christ gives life. He gives life in a very broad and general sense. He is the source and sustainer of life itself in a very broad, general term. And we see this again. This is not just John coming up with this. God sustains the living world, even to this day, even in its fallen state. It continues to exist. The rain continues to fall on both the righteous and the unrighteous alike because God ordains it. We have Hebrews 1.3 uh, asserting that... He, that is Christ, upholds all things by the word of his power. We looked at Colossians last week. This is actually 
um, the Greek slogan for my seminary school, that in him, that is in Christ, all things hold together. That if he were to metaphorically take his hand off the wheel for one moment, it would fly apart. And indeed, at the day of judgment, that is precisely what will happen, Peter tells us. The very elements will melt in the fiery heat of his return, because there'll be no more need for them. Matthew, Matthew 10, 29 and 30, Jesus talks about the father. You may remember these verses, the father and falling sparrows. He sees the smallest sparrow fall. That means that nothing, even tiny, tiny birds in the creation, escape his view. Again, Matthew 6, Jesus tells us the Father feeds the birds and cares for them. And then he goes, in two verses later, reminds his listeners how God sustains the lilies of the field. Yes, and if God dressed the lilies in this way, don't you think that he will also provide clothing for you? So he not only creates, he sustains, and he continues to sustain. But if you've got your Bible there, turn with me to Job, because, um, well, first off, I love going to Job, and I love this particular section of Job. But if you really want to, like, let's, let's go to the source. Let's hear from God himself about how creation runs entirely and solely according to him. At the end of Job, I'm thinking Job, end of 38 into 39. And to refresh your memory, the story of Job, Job is being tested. Satan has asked permission to come and test Job, and Job endures because he knows ultimately that God is sovereign and God is good. In the middle, we have this Job come and joined by his three and then four friends who generally prove themselves foolish and useless. And finally, his friends having provided no answers, Job turns to God and says, what has all of this been about? And be careful what you wish for, because God speaks to Job from out of the whirlwind. In fact, verse uh, chapter 38, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, and he starts to explain to him. And if you have 38 there, just a cursory look, note that God starts giving what explanation, and he never really does talk about the challenge or why Job had to go through all of this, but rather he asserts his sovereignty for chapters, plural. God asserts his sovereignty and sustenation over all of the creation. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Who stretched the line upon it? Uh, how is the foundation of the universe sunk? You'll notice that most of 38, God talks about the physical creation, the earth, the stars, the, the movements of the sea, the dwelling of light itself, storehouses of snow, rain, the stars. Again, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? So he, he begins by saying, let's look at the physical universe, Job. And then at the end of 38 and into 39, he shifts. He goes, let's look at life on earth, Job. You think life on earth is just a random collection of amino acids and proteins that are evolving and running around with devil may care? No, my hand, my eye is on it all. At 39, verse 39 of 38, he starts talking about, Can you hunt prey for the lion, or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their den, or lie wait in the thicket? He says, I provide prey for the lions, Job. How about you? Into 39, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? I do. Do you, Job? When the mountain goats give birth... Do you observe the calving of the does? Can you number the months that they fulfill? That is, how long they're pregnant. Do you know the time that they give birth? At verse 5, who has let the wild donkey go free? When you look on the savanna, when you look and see animals just running here and there, do you think that that's just chaos? That that's just nature at work? No, I am there, says the Lord God. I, even though he goes free, who has loosed the bonds of the swift donkeys to whom I have given the arid plain his home and the salt land for his dwelling place. It's all because of me. He runs free because of me. The land he runs free in, I gave to him. At verse 9, is the wild ox willing to serve you, Job? 
Can you bind him? And verse 13, how about the wings of the ostrich, which wave proudly? But are they the pinions and the plumage of love? He talks about her leaving her eggs. Uh, at, at verse 19, same chapter, do you give the horse his might? He goes into the living world and just says again and again, like hammer blows on poor Job, it's all me. Look at the creation, you'll see me. It is not chaos. It is not random. It is intentional. It is directed. It is sovereign. And it all testifies, the Lord says, so that I might be known. For reference, you can go back to the beginning of Paul's argument in Romans 1, that God's invisible attributes are literally written as a painter would sign in the bottom corner, are literally written across creation. So that none are without excuse. All men know there is a God. Many men may choose to ignore that fact, and they do so at their peril. But the creation has been created to speak of the Creator. And the very life within that creation, the amazing intricacies of not only individual living organisms. Think about your breathing for a moment. Think about the amazing chemical interchange that happens when we draw oxygen into lungs and carbon monoxide laden red blood cells offload to take on fresh oxygen and bring it to the heart to the rest of the bloodstream and then you exhale poisonous carbon dioxide which you have used up and you do that how many hundreds of thousands of times a day your very breathing is a miracle It's almost a wonder that Job didn't ask, have you considered your breathing, Job, how you do that? And of course, now we know it's all what is called autonomic. We don't have to think about breathing. And it's a good thing, because I, in particular, with a brain made of Swiss cheese, would forget how to breathe. I would. The Lord goes on in in chapter 40, goes on talking about these amazing animals about Leviathan and about Behemoth. He says, there are things in the creation you've never even seen. I am the Lord of them as well. So, all of that, to bring this back to John, that's Zoe. That is Zoe in a very general application. That is life, and it all stems from Christ, through whom all things were created, created by him, through him, and for him. God also ordains, this is important for us as well, God also ordains, because he is sovereign over all of life, God also ordains when life shall end. This is perhaps particularly pertinent, I didn't mean it so, but let's give this one to providence. In a country such as ours, which is expanding made, week by week and more by more, and now mental illness can be a legitimate reason for ending one's life under medical assistance in dying. And in fact, there are those who are so impoverished and destitute that they are advocating that their poverty is reason enough to be legally allowed to end their lives. And the state, despite its protestations, our state is actually okay with this. I read a headline from CBC News out west earlier this week that said that Expanded assistance in dying could save, I believe it's the province of Alberta, more than $138 million a year because it doesn't cost the Ministry of Health anything to take care of a dead person. Oh, the savings! It is not Justin Trudeau, nor any premier, nor even a doctor in an emergency room who dictates when life shall end. It is he who gives life, he who sustains life. He and he alone decides when it ends. We may provide mercy and comfort in that ending, but it is not for us to decide. God ordains when life shall end. Here here are some scriptural proofs for this. Matthew 6, 27 Jesus, this is the word of Jesus himself, saying that your worry cannot add one hour to your life. Do not be anxious for anything. You think that the more anxious you are, the longer you're going to live? The, The more things you worry about? No. 
not a single hour. Psalm 139, 16, the psalmist writes, To God in your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me. Our lives are pre-measured, and they won't go one second longer. Isaiah 38, in these first five verses, God instructs the prophet. For, here's a practical application. God instructs the prophet Isaiah to tell King Hezekiah, who was one of the kings in Israel, that because he had repented, because he had enacted reforms, God says, go and tell him, I will add 15 years to your life so that he may reign in righteousness and be an example of righteousness a little longer. And of course, staying with Job, Job chapter 14, Job says this, man's days are determined and the number of his months is with you, he's speaking to God, and you have appointed limits that he cannot pass. And, I would give you this morning, limits that he dare not circumvent. Contrast this with Luke 12. And the man who thought that he had years to enjoy that which he had saved up. This is uh, Luke 12, verses 19 and 20. Jesus speaks a a brief kind of off-the-cuff parable about a man who saved and scrimped and stored up all worldly goods, all manner of things, and then, I guess, he's right, he saved for his retirement. Boy, I can't wait to retire at age 55 on my boat. I'm going to go fishing, get the cottage up north. I've got years to enjoy it, and then is told that he's actually going to die tonight. Oops. So much for your plans. In fact, there's a Yiddish proverb, man plans, God laughs. So generally, life, the life, the word, the concept that John introduces here at the beginning of his gospel, yes, can apply to all living things, can apply to living, dying, reproducing after its own kind, generational, interconnected, all of those aspects of the world. But that's not really the focus of the gospel, is it? The focus of the gospel is that you would know Christ and therefore have spiritual life. And again, if we're talking that spiritual life is found in Christ and Christ alone, that must be stated because it is refuting and presenting itself in opposition to the truth that spiritual death is therefore found everywhere. Spiritual life particularly as opposed to spiritual death. Well, yes, this is John's focus, but it's not solely John's focus. Um, Again, turn with with your Bibles. We're going to look at, um, maybe I'll camp here for a moment, Ephesians 2. So head past John, past Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, and then Galatians to Ephesians 2. A reminder that um, this letter has become known to us as Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Uh, Biblical scholars would... uh, would say that it is actually more of a circular letter. It was sent maybe to Ephesus first to be copied and then distributed, and that at some point, because we have early, very early manuscripts that don't include the words to Ephesus. So this is not just a word to the Ephesian church, this is a word to every church. And note at chapter 2 how the Apostle Paul begins to remind the church at Ephesus and every church that would receive these words. Look at the truth that he begins at verse 2. This reminder, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, that's Satan, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. A reminder to Christians in every church, in every time, in every nation, every corner of the world, don't ever become so high and mighty that you look down your nose at those who are outside and think, I am so much better. Never become the Pharisee from Luke saying, I thank you, God, that I am not like other men, especially this filthy tax collector over here. That is our temptation, isn't it? To become egotistical in our salvation, to think, oh, I got mine. Sorry about you. No, never. This reminder, this constant reminder. It is this constant reminder that engenders our gospel fervor and our pity towards those outside. I was once like you. I was once 
under wrath. We were all once under wrath. We were all once headed directly for an eternity in hell. But God. But. We were all once dead. That is, yes, we were alive. Yes, we went to work five days a week. Yes, we had families. Yes, we went to the grocery store. Yes, we did all the minutiae and running around of life. And yes, we were part of a biosphere full of life. But we were, for all of that busyness, when God looks down on us, or rather I should say past tense, looked down on us from the, his throne at the apex of creation, all he see. Now, and all he saw in us were just the shufflings of dead men. Oh, but that is the great lie of the world, isn't it? Just busy yourself. A busy life is a full life. It's a fruitful life. It's the lie of materialism. The bigger house equals the better life. The bigger TV means that you'll be happier. The more cars in the driveway, the more success. Well, the question then is, the question that we were once confronted with, the question that we are right to confront others with is this. Does any of that make you alive? Oh, sure, I feel great. I feel great when I get to sit in my big comfy chair and watch my 70-inch LED TV and... No, when God looks down, he sees a dead man He sees a world full of dead men and women. You were dead. And what is it that made us dead? Our trespasses and sins. And we walked following the course of this world, carrying out the desires, at verse 3 here, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, which were by nature. So here's the consequence of the fallen creation. Here's the consequence of the world being popped excuse me, populated and peopled by dead people, that we are all children of wrath like the rest of mankind. God's wrath is consistently and increasingly being stored up against the world and the people in it. I often remark at football games, oh, the World Cup is going on, I'd be surprised there's probably somebody there who's got a John 316 placard I always see John 16, John 3:16. I never see Psalm 7:11. God is angry with the wicked every day. But God, here you go at verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, in our trespasses, what, what did he do? What did he do by mercy? Even when we were in this zombie-like state of death, he made us alive together with Christ. And therefore, he says, it is by grace that you have been saved. And he did also this. He raised us up. Christ died on the cross of Calvary. He was dead, dead, dead. We'll look more at this at Easter. They pulled his body down. No breath, no movement, cold, waxing. They packed him in, well, Nicodemus, we know, came and gave a hundred pounds of aloe and myrrh and sweet-smelling spices, and they put him in a hole in the ground in a rock tomb and sealed it for three days. He was dead. And then that glorious Sunday morning, when the women came and the stone was rolled away, And he was no longer dead because he had defeated death itself. He was risen. And so those that profess him to be Christ, that's us. Those that follow him, we are like he was raised up from death. We are raised up from death. We are raised up from spiritual death in the here and now. We will enter into a deathless state of eternal life in the world to come. So he raised us up with him, with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us all in Christ. This is Zoe. 
This is life. This is what John is talking about. This is the whole purpose for his gospel, that you may know that Jesus is the Christ and be raised up out of your spiritual death now, today, immediately. Jesus himself said, I have come. Why did, why did, why did Jesus come? Why do we have Christmas? Why did the word put on flesh? Jesus himself answers this. He came to seek and save the lost. He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And he came so that his sheep, that is those who hear his voice and enter in and follow after him, John may have life and have it abundantly, zoe, spiritual life. You are dead until the master call you. Don Carson, I was reading one of his commentaries, and he said, it's very difficult to preach on these opening verses because the great temptation, of course, is to bring in additional material from John. And uh, I'll just say that he was right because I'm going to do this anyway. <laughs> Have I got time? Yeah, let's do this. Can you raise yourself to life? That's really the question. Can you raise yourself to life? No, you can't. I am the good shepherd, he says here, John. And if you've got your Bible, let's, let's do one more stop. And then, I'll, then I'll, I'll stop. I really will. John 11. Here is this in exemplary form. Jesus has a friend. His name is Lazarus. He has two sisters, Mary and Martha. Lazarus uh, becomes sick. Word comes to Jesus. Lazarus is sick. Uh, come, and, come and heal him. And Jesus says, okay, and then doesn't move. He stays where he is ministering, and by the time he finally gets to Lazarus, Lazarus is uh, dead. He's actually several days dead. And he, people are gathered outside the tomb. They have put Lazarus, they have wrapped him in burial clothes, and they have put him in the family tomb. They've sealed it with a stone. Lazarus has been there several days now. When Jesus finally arrives, the two sisters run out and say, Oh, Jesus, it's, if only you had come sooner, you could have healed him. He wouldn't have died. And yet I know that even so, he will be with you in the resurrection. Because Jesus says, I hear, I am the resurrection and the life. She, she thinks in terms of eschatology. She's got very good eschatology, these women. She says, oh, yes, there will be a day of resurrection. I, I know I'll see him again. Well, after weeping with those who weep and expressing his love, take a look at verse 38. Think you can raise yourself to life? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha tries to stop him, saying, he has been dead several days. Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. The King James says, surely he stinketh. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And as John would say, that believing you may have life in his name. Now when he had said those things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. What happens at verse 44? Christ says it is done, and what happens? The man who had died came out. His hands and feet were bound with linen straps, his face wrapped with a cloth. He's in his burial shroud. Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Jesus says, Lazarus, come to life. Come out of that place of death. Come out of that place of darkness. Come out to me. And he does. So, here's the question. What could Lazarus do to raise himself back to life? Nothing. 
We are dead in our sins and trespasses. We are spiritually dead. And despite what the world tells you, despite every other faith narrative that says, here's the formula, here's what you have to do, it's all lies and deception. Satan does not want you to know the truth, but here is the truth. That life is his to give and his alone. And the good gospel news of salvation and the message of Christmas is that he gives it freely and abundantly. What do I have to do to receive eternal life? You just have to believe. Believe that he is the Christ and you will have life, spiritual life, abundantly. You will leave your state of spiritual death behind. He will raise you up to new life immediately, now, today, and he will walk with you for the rest of these days on earth in a new raised space of spiritual likeness and life. You will be raised like him. Then you will be molded ever more into his likeness, that you may have life. And that life, John says, is the light of the world. Jesus is a lighthouse. The gospel good news of Christ, the message of Christmas, is a light in a very dark world. And so we profess and we testify and we evangelize into the darkness that, as John says here at verse 9, the true light which gives light to everything was coming into the world from John's perspective. It hasn't happened yet in the source of his gospel, but for us, has come into the world, and that light has a name, and that name is Jesus. In him is life, spiritual life, as opposed to spiritual death, and that promise and that reality is the light of men. It draws them to safety as a lighthouse guides a ship to shore. The light shines in the darkness, That is the truth. The person of Christ shines like a spotlight on a dark stage. He shines in the middle of a world that is fallen and godless and happy to increase in that. He shines. Oh, but so too do his people. Yes? Matthew 5. You are the light of the world. So do not hide your light under a bushel. You are the light of the world. I'll give you this as we close. If Christians are the light of the world, and Jesus says we are, if Christians are the light of the world, then it is only because he who is the true light has bestowed radiance upon us. We do not shine with a light that is our own, but rather we are a people of reflection. We are not a people of generation. If we think ourselves ever capable of self-illumination, we are mistaken, and it may be that Christ is not in us. Our goal this Christmas season, therefore, is not to proclaim our own light, but to proclaim he who has come and is the true light. And for the rest of the calendar year, it is not to be our own light, but it is to reflect the light of Christ so that men may be drawn to the light of life, whether it is snowy or sunny, windy or rainy, December or August. Christ is the light of the world, and we are in him. And that is gospel good news that we all need to be reminded of, and that this world desperately needs to be told. God, our Heavenly Father, as we prepare our hearts and minds to come to your table as the family meal to celebrate the atonement that the Word made flesh eventually bought each and every one of us by, we give you praise and glory and thanksgiving for these opening five verses. I could probably preach more messages How deep is their truth? How amazing is the wonderment? How high is the height and wide is the breadth? And how deep is the depth of your love and mercy? That even while we were yet your enemies, even while we were yet citizens in the kingdom of darkness and loving it, that nevertheless you sent your son to pay the price we never could 
so that we could be reconciled to you, so that we could be birthed anew, no longer children of disobedience and darkness, but now children of light and life, alive for the first time, even in a life of busyness and running around. Father God, all praise and glory is due you for this amazing work of grace. Make us a people not only displaying it, but eager to tell the gospel good news behind it. We pray all of this in the Savior's name. Amen.